Okay, guys, here we go. 1920s. Let's jump into it. We got some flapper situations going on here. Women defying social norms. And we've got the jazz music because we had the Harlem Renaissance, you know, from the Great Migration and um, and this explosion of pride taking place in areas like Harlem, New York. So let's get into it. Let's talk about everything 1920s. So here's a major event of 1920s. It's called the Scopes Monkey Trial. The reason it's called the Scopes Monkey Trial is because we've got a high school teacher, high school science teacher, who is teaching the theory of evolution to his students, and therefore it goes to court. So why does it go to court? Well, we have always um, traditionally been uh, teaching creationism at this time and in Tennessee where this takes place creationism is being taught now creationism is also known as fundamentalism or traditionalism these are words you need to know okay now the opposite for what for teaching this would be to be a modernist and kind of the secularist, secularism, modernism. This is the argument back and forth. Now, when something goes to court, you got to have people that um, are arguing for either side. Here you will have William Jennings, Brian, and over here you will have Clarence Darrow. Okay. Now, what is the end result? Um, Scopes goes to jail. He's got to pay a fine that he's initially let off the hookup because this was not like an oops, I got caught. This was a purposely done so he would get caught so he could go to court because it's not about what should can the teacher do it or not. The law says the teacher cannot. It's about changing that law. So we have to start it here first, right? So that was the point of the Scopes monkey trial. So he will get in trouble. He'll go to uh, go to court. William Jennings Bryan will die soon after. Even though William, like they rule against Scopes, it's considered that um, the modernist secularist uh, Clarence Darrow wins the case because it's moving away from the creationism in the school. What a star wants you to know at the end of the day, this is kind of a birthplace for expanding the concept of church versus state in the school, okay? And then the, anything else that you need to know is really just literally the, like, what it is. What is Scopes Monkey Trial? Who's involved? And you really have to know who is and who isn't a fundamentalist. So it'll ask things like, Clarence Darrow was against fundamentalism. He was a modernist. Uh, William Jennings Bryan was a fundamentalist, okay? So that's really what this is looking for. Okay, so what does a teapot have anything to do with oil? This is going to be the teapot dome scandal. So why is it called teapot? Because it takes place in Teapot, Wyoming. Okay, now um, it also takes place in some other areas, but we're mainly focused on the issue in Teapot, Wyoming. This is going to be under the Harding administration. This is who the scandal is under. Harding president, Harding's administration okay so what's the problem here well when something that belongs to the government goes up for drilling rights or anything like that which is what the case is here drilling rights for the um for the oil it is put up for a bid so that um private companies can bid on the rights to drill now this was not done instead what the Harding administration did was um give rights to a company in exchange in exchange for bribes and they did not um, did not open for bid so they didn't give anybody else um, a chance to bid at it they just took a bribe and gave another company that bribed them the chance to do it um, the people who are involved will go on trial to lose their jobs and some will go to jail so that's the concept here but what does the star want you to know as far as this is concerned. Well, the star wants you to know that um, 
the American people lose their trust in the government and their politicians. Okay, they're elected officials. That's it. That's what they want you to know. Aside from the main points of it's in Wyoming and it's President Harding's administration and that it was an oil scandal, um, exactly what I said, giving rights to a company in exchange for bribes. It's really about the American people losing their trust in their government, uh, their politicians, you know, elected officials. Okay, we just talked a little bit um, before the Teapot Dome scandal about uh, the theory of evolution, which was through Darwinism. Now, this concept is actually going to be taken a step further in the 1920s, and we are going to look at it through the social Darwinism scope. And this is the concept that poor people are poor because they don't want to be rich, and they don't want to be rich or work hard to do so because they have bad genetics. And so um, we're really looking at eugenics here. Now, poor is, when we think about Darwinism, and it was, you know, always construed as monkeys turning into people, then the poor would be over here with the monkeys and the rich would be over here with, um, sorry, not the P, with man, okay? I'm going to write man there and I'm going to write monkey here, okay? Now, this totally ignores social constructs that are set into place that in usually will keep a person um, having a very, very hard time getting out of being poor. Like, for example, I always tell my students this example. Now, if you are born to a family who has no money, and they need you to work um, while you go to school, then your grades probably aren't going to be as good as the person who doesn't have to work while they go to school. Well, their job is studying and, and going to school. Um, so now they have better uh, educational opportunities. If they're able to get into a better school because of their educational opportunities, then they more likely are going to graduate and more uh, because they're already set up for success um, with their education. But now they're going to a better school and they're more likely to obtain a better job afterwards. Whereas you can have somebody who is... Um, poor, they managed to graduate high school, but they have nobody helping them. So they've got to uh, find a job, but maybe they live in an area where jobs are further away and there's no buses. So now they have to find a way to get to that job. If they manage to maybe get a car of some sort, is it going to be probably as good of a car as somebody whose parents bought them one? Um, if they get a low-end car, they have to pay for the maintenance and they have to pay for the gas and they have to get the job, get to the work, you know, and it's probably not the best job, right? And so whatever money they make, let's say their car breaks down. Do they make the payment on that car or do they fix the car? If they fix the car, they may lose the car. If they pay on the car, they can't drive it. So they can't get to work. And it's this constant situation right here, okay? And so there are some social constructs that keep people poor. So the idea of social Darwinism, that it's based on your genetics, whether you stay poor or not, is um, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? It also doesn't make sense to us over here because it is on this end of time, you know, over here when we understand more about genetics than they did in the 1920s, but they're going to take the concept of genetics and go even further with the social Darwinism concept, and they are going to say that genetics is definitely tied to whether you are poor or whether you are rich, okay? Now, by connecting genetics, they are also going to connect nativism. They are going to say that genetically poor people and genetically rich people, what are the common denominators? Well, the majority of rich people are of Western European descent. Now, is that the case that they have better genetics, or is it the fact that um, minorities were inherently kept from educational opportunities for a very long time. And there is still uh, segregation going on. There is um, policies set into place that keep people from getting a good education and good jobs and stuff like that. So are the rich rich because they are genetically superior or are they rich because there are social constructs that kept them that way at this time? So, um, but they're going to go off the fact that it's genetics, right? And what is the common denominator? Well, Western European and poor everything else. Okay, so let's go a little bit further to see what we understand. Now, eugenics is going to come and play a role in here. But before I go further, you what everything else, right? Anything but Western European. But let's also add in the concept of feeble-minded. So you could be Western European and be a woman. And if you're considered feeble-minded, you will get the effects of eugenics. 
um, intellectually disabled. Um, you could be disabled of any kind, maybe not intellectually disabled, but be considered disabled to some degree here. Okay, now what's going to happen? The effects of eugenics. Now eugenics is the concept that that good DNA, right? Now we're of course we're simplifying, but the good DNA here um, will multiply. You want to multiply it. So um, find somebody of good DNA. They good stature. They good strong person. Marry a good strong woman, and you have lots of babies in order to increase this good DNA. Okay, now completely ignoring the fact that there's a lot of, which of course they didn't know, there's a lot of um, disabilities that are caused through genetic mutations. So they wouldn't have known that. It has nothing to do necessarily with how one looks on the outside, right? But this is the idea of eugenics. Increase the good DNA. Now, and of course it's rooted in nativism, but let's go further. What do we do with the bad DNA, right? Well, the con the the what they did with it was they sterilized. So they would force sterilize people without their consent um, while they were uh, getting surgeries done or um, they were knocked out and they would be, uh, they would have this happen to them. Um, there was one woman who was her, she was a rich uh, woman, Western European descent, and her mother had her sterilized during a surgery and she did not know it and found out later it was because her mother said, well, she was feeble-minded and shouldn't have children. So this affected a lot of people. Um, and, and it was actually praised um, by the Nazi movement later on. So eugenics has a huge root um, in the United States. And it'll pop its head up every now and then in different ways. Uh, what a star wants you to know? Pretty much the concept. The concept of what it is and where it came from. And we're really going to see it here with those people who are still hanging around, you know, that old money that we saw pop up with the monopoly owners and stuff like that are really who push this as a justification for their um, continued practices. Forward in um, the 1920s, and of course we will see prohibition, their biggest um, issue that they are pushing is prohibition, which is to make alcohol illegal. It'll be passed by the 18th Amendment and strengthened by the Volstead, Volstead Act, okay? Now, the social gospel movement is that early Protestantism movement that's pushing, um, and I'm going to write that here. This is that Protestant movement that's pushing um their uh, biblical beliefs to fixing social issues. And one of the biggest social issues that they're focusing on is prohibition, alcoholism. They believe that that is one of the biggest ills of society, why men are beating their women and, um, and not taking care of their families, uh, women going astray in that flapper um, concept and stuff like that. And it's really going to be pushed. Um, we will, of course, see the 18th Amendment repealed with the 21st amendment easy to remember you have to be 21 um you have to at least be 21 years old to drink and so this is going to be alcohol is now legal okay now why would they turn around and change it if it was initially set up and and okay like we initially made it to where it was illegal why change it well this is because te uh temperance or prohibition le led to two issues okay those two issues are um, that you're tested on at least speakeasies. I'm just going to put speakeasies, but speakeasies and organized crime. So, what is organized crime? The mob. This is a star question. Okay, so you do need to know that. Now, the mob is going to lead to bootlegged alcohol stock cars, which leads to NASCAR. Um, because, you know, they've got to make cars that are fast enough to get away from um, officers and stuff like that. So the crime rises when they prohibit alcohol. So if there is a market for something to be sold, if you make it illegal, the market still exists. So now somebody will become the person to sell on the illegal market to make money, and that was the mob. It will raise uh, crime rates, and so they will repeal 
So this is repealed and becomes the 21st Amendment, okay? That's what you need to know about the temperance movement and the social gospel movement. Okay, what do we need to know about the Red Scare? Well, it all came about from the Bolshevik Revolution, okay? Now, what is that? That is Russia during World War I is going to have a revolution and they are going to overthrow Tsar Nicholas. We're tired of you being mean to us, mistreating us, and they will eventually become communist. Now, what does this mean for us with regard to Star? Well, the Palmer Raids. Palmer Raids are, um, are us right, like kind of going around and finding everybody who is of Eastern European descent and um, rounding them up uh, without due process and all of their you know constitutional rights and checking to see if they're spies and everything else. So that's what this leads to. We will see this same type of thing happen again during the Cold War with regard to McCarthyism. Okay. Um, we will also see something kind of similar with regard to the Patriot Act when we start um, when we start looking at people from Middle Eastern descent. So this is not an uncommon theme here in the United States. Um, I mean, what does Star want you to know about this really? Well, when the Bolshevik Revolution happens, it makes uh, Germany only have to only had to fight on one front because um, you know Russia is the Eastern front, right? Eastern uh, European front. So now that that's out of the picture, Germany only has to fight on the Western front. That's really what you need to know about the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, you also need to know that it led to Russia eventually becoming communist, and now we're afraid that we'll be Pomerade. So that's pretty much all that you need to know for Star. Let's get into some people that you have to know. Henry Ford. Okay, what do you got to know about Henry Ford? Well, you got to know about his, his Model T. What does that mean for American citizens? Well, it makes... More vehicles, more cars faster. How does it do that? The assembly line. What are the effects? A flooded market. Not necessarily flooded, but the more that you make of something, the, um, the less it costs. More product. Product is the car. less it cost okay now that means that more americans can have vehicles it is more accessible more accessible vehicles okay this is literally the whole point to henry ford the biggest issue the biggest thing that you're tested on right now star says what they want to know the assembly line they want to know this process so they could ask you anything within the process and you have to be able to come back and tell them well, assembly line made cars more accessible because it put out more cars faster and therefore people could afford it more. Um, more cars meant more people could afford them. Therefore, they could travel and go visit places they never did before because they didn't have vehicles. More cars that are more accessible to Americans means that Americans can move out of the city and drive into the city for work now. So it really does lead to a lot. It, it is it has many many effects from it okay and it is tested like a timeline generally or there'll be pictures of vehicles either way the only vehicle that we are tested on is henry ward's um, assembly line and model t so if you see anything like that you know this is the concept we're talking about star says that you need to know he is a Pan-Africanist. What does that mean? That means that he is for everybody from any part of Africa. What else? He is somewhat of a segregationalist. Okay, so he believes that the African-American community should help one another. Okay, and not rely so much on the white community. And he is for a move back 
to Africa, okay? This is what he stands for. That is most likely what you'll be tested on. The only other way I've seen him tested is that he is um, an inspiration to Martin Luther King, okay? Okay, so what do we got going here? Well, we got Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. And if you can tell by the um, quickly drawn um, aircraft that I drew, they are pilots. So what are they notable for uh, being pilots for? Well, Charles Lindbergh is notable for his transatlantic non-stop flight, okay? And then Amelia Earhart is known as being the first female pilot to fly across the Atlantic. Okay, that's what they're known for. That's all you need to know. Okay, what do we need to know about these groups? Let's get to it. Immigration, Quotas Act. We talked a little bit about this already in, in a video, um, a couple videos ago. Quotas Act. Certain regions can only have certain amount of people um, immigrate in. Okay, so some regions can have a lot more than other regions. S specifically speaking, Western European regions can have more than all the other regions. Okay, so the Chinese Exclusion Act was kind of like allude, alluded to a Quotas Act, which we will now have. Native Americans, what do we need to know for them? 1924 citizens citizenship there we go and that's what star wants you to know okay so let's get into technology what do we need to know electricity and telephones are more acceptable and more more accessible and more reliable steel sky rise um, buildings and especially the Empire State Building in New York which was built or started to be built in 1930 and then household appliances like stove, iron, and oven. But how, how do we afford those household items that I'm talking about? We afford those household items through credit. Now, what do I want you to take away from credit as far as STAR is concerned? Concerned? Consumerism. Consumerism is the idea that we are buying a lot. We are consuming a lot. We have the money, we come out with a lot of money. Um, we are a rich country after World War I and we have a lot of money to spend, and so we do. We buy all of those things, um, like household items and stuff like that on credit, but we also buy something else on credit, and that is stock. Stock is um, a publicly, stock is publicly traded, um, investments okay so from publicly traded companies okay so you have a company that is on the stock market because it's publicly traded which means that normal everyday people and investors can put money into that company the idea is is that if a company is worth one thing when you buy it you want it to go up so that when you sell it it's worth more so you purchased it at this price let's say ten dollars and you sell sell it you want it to be worth more Hopefully, maybe $50. You made 40 bucks when you sell it, right? That's the concept here. The problem is, is that people and banks are buying stock. So, people and banks. So, you've got your investors, you got your normal people, and you have your banks buying stock, okay, on credit. Okay, now what we call buying stock on credit buying buying on margin and the way that we buy on margin is that we we may pay let's say 10% down for the stock okay so if the stock is worth $100 then we are going to pay $10 right because we're only paying 10% now when we sell it we're wanting it to be worth more so we're kind of taking a gamble right what if it's worth less then we lose money so the idea of taking a gamble is what we call speculation. We're going to speculate. We're going to guess what this stock is going to be worth at the time we plan to sell it. And we're going to guess that it's going to be worth more, which is why we buy it. Okay. Now, if we speculate 
that the stock is going to actually be worth 110 at the at the time of sell, right? So we decide it's a safe buy, it's a safe risk. We're going to we're going to take it, okay? So we're going to buy it for 110. We paid $10 for it. So let's take that $10 away. So we should get $100 back, right? But we still owe what was left here, right? Which is that $90. So $90 is what we owe. So we got 100 back after selling it. Now we have to pay back that 90. So what are we left with? $10 profit. $10 profit, okay? That's the concept here of stock markets. You want to buy at a specific price, you want it to raise and then sell it so you can make money, okay? Now, this would be the same thing as if you were buying baseball cards and you would hope that they would be worth more later, okay? Now, the problem with speculation is that stock isn't always worth what you think it's going to be at the time of sell. And when all of this is taking place, people are buying stock on credit with money they don't have. They're making risky investments and they are not um, trustworthy investors. And so banks are lending money. Banks are using other people's money like they shouldn't. And the uh, market will try to correct itself. So we have the idea that the market corrects itself. Okay. Now, if the market correct it, corrects itself, then what a stock is really worth is not what people have been speculating. The problem is, is that people are going to speculate that a stock is worth more than what it is and what it will be as a way to try and manipulate the market. Manipulate the market would be a concept that you are lying about where it's gonna be so you can make money now. So if you're manipulating the market, you are lying about the market's condition. If you are lying about the market's condition, you are doing it so you can make money now, okay? People are going to start to see that maybe things aren't really worth the way that, as much as they're worth, right? They're going to start spending less money. They're going to start pulling back. Um, when people start to pull back on their spending, we start to see the trends of a recession take place. If people are spending less, then companies are making less. Therefore, they can't afford to hire as many people as they have, and they begin to let people off. They begin to start the process of unemployment. And then once so many people become unemployed, then even more people can't spend money. Then companies are making even less and they have to let everyone else go. And then eventually the company goes under. If you had stock in a company that has this happen to them, you are going to have to owe on all this stock that's going to be worth nothing. And that's what takes place during the Great Depression. And we will get more into it um, as we go along. And um, let's get into your next video when you're ready.